Hi, I'm Glenn Russell. Welcome to a special book exploration of the book of Matthew. A fascinating book. We're so glad that you joined us. This is part of the series on 3ABN entitled Books of the Book. It's an it's a extraordinary series and I'm so glad you're part of it. We want to welcome our guest, Dr. Ronko Stefanovic, uh, pastor, teacher, and friend. Uh, Ronko, you teach New Testament at Andrews University Theological Seminary. Why do you want to sp have us spend some time in the book of Matthew? Just give us a sentence or two. What's the motivation? You see, for instance, when we read the book of Revelation, it's telling us what the future brings to us and how Jesus will come. The book of Romans is telling us how we are saved before God, but the Gospel of Matthew is telling us how we should live as Christians in this life, as, as the followers of Jesus Christ. All right, we want to learn much more about our Savior here in the book yes. of Matthew. Before we go any further, let's make sure we ask the Spirit to guide us. Let's pray together. Lord, as we open your word, open our hearts. May we be drawn to you. May we see your portrait through this marvelous book of Matthew. Lord, teach us your message for today that we may be faithful to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Ronco, last time we, we took a look at the genealogy of Jesus and, and you made the point that this family tree, this, this lineage of Jesus, uh, People in, in Matthew's day thought that could save you. Now we're going to look at a section today of people who were in that family tree. They didn't do so well. Is that where we're going yes. today? We're taking a look at the birth of Jesus. What a fantastic place for us. You to see, be. Glenn, without Jesus and His coming and His death on the cross, yes. all those people that are, they have a place in the genealogy, they would not have any hope. He came to save His people who lived in the past, and He came to save His people who will live in the future, including you and me and the right. viewers. That are now, the Gospels have several accounts. We have a, an account in Luke, but let's look at the uniqueness of Matthew's portrait of the birth of Jesus. Yeah, actually what Matthew has in chapter 1, 18 to 25, it's not found in other synoptics. Yes. So I would like, Glenn, to ask you for a favor if sure. you can read verses 18 to 25. All right, we're looking at Matthew chapter 1, yeah, 18 verse 18. To 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make a public spectacle of her, remi was reminded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Jesus. Now, Ronco, there's a few observations, questions I have for you. I found that when I think about the birth of a child, I usually ask mom and find out what mother's perspective is. This seems a little different. What should we notice about this story of the birth of Jesus? Actually, it seems that verses 18 to 25, it's a footnote or elaboration of this genealogy that we have. Mm -hmm. You remember that we talk in verse 16? that while all these people that are mentioned in genealogy, they had something to do with the birth of their child. In verse 16, Joseph had nothing to do with the birth of Jesus Christ. Because according to verses 18 to 25, Jesus was not born because of Joseph. Actually, it says clearly that Mary and Joseph did not have sexual intercourse after the birth of, 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 of Jesus, Jesus. So Jesus was not an ordinary man. 
and the original readers of the Gospel of Matthew, they could easily recognize that actually here was the promised one mm. that God made in Genesis chapter 3, 15. You know, at the beginning of this genealogy, he was, and now he came to save his people from their sins. Matthew is painting the portrait of, of our Savior, Jesus yes. Christ. Immediately he's showing us there's something unique about Jesus. Yes. No other religion, no other person, no one is like Jesus. He wants us to see that even from the beginning of Jesus' life. So, uh, when we see it, we have to understand something about uh, Jewish weddings. Because in verse 19, so many times the readers of the Gospel of Matthew are confused. He says that Joseph and Mary were not married yet. Mm -hmm. But in verse 19, Joseph is called her husband. You know, in the Jewish wedding, ancient wedding, wedding practices, when two young people became engaged uh, to each other, uh, they were already considered to be husband and wife. They could not have sexual intercourse. Mm -hmm. But uh, any divorce, okay, any separation, it was a great offense. It was mm. almost like adultery. You know, you know. It was like 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 a div di di divorce. Why? Because uh, they had to pay dowry, etc. They had to make those family arrangements, and that's why Joseph was already. So their relationships were serious. The wedding was being prepared, and now Joseph found that actually Mary was was pregnant. And there's something beautifully mysterious about the description here in verse 18. It, it, we don't have an explanation of all the biology of the birth of no, Jesus. No. We have this reference, she was found. It's a beautiful way of, of telling us that there's a reality here that he'll need to respond to, that all the Jewish readers will need to respond to, but it's not all explained because there's a mystery of God. But there is something that's not mystery according to the Gospel of Matthew. You see, there are many details they're very mysterious in the birth of Jesus. But there is one thing that is not mysterious. It's verse 22. Now, all this mm. took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. This is the first of 40 quotations of the Old Testament in the Gospel of Matthew. Everything in the Gospel of Matthew, with reference to, G to Jesus, starting with his birth and going all through his life, Actually, the Gospel of Matthew was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. So there's no extreme break with yeah, the past. No. You see, God continues His movement. God promised in the Old Testament that he, the promised deliverer will come. He will save His people. Now, the fulfillment of that prophecy is evident, is here in the Gospel of Matthew. But Glenn, then when we move on, then what is the strange? I'm sorry, we have to go to the Gospel of John just quickly. He says, he came to his own, hmm. and his own people did not accept him. You're, you're suggesting such a sad reality of a human experience. God's initiative, God's Son, and yet rejection. So now, no, no, we move, we move to chapter 2. If I could review then in chapter 1, Please. this mystery of of Mary's pregnancy through the Holy Spirit, she has to make a decision about Jesus. Yeah. And when it's revealed to her, not how, but who, and who is that God has come upon her and, and, and she will have a son, and that son will be the Savior, she's obedient. Now Joseph has to make a decision about Jesus. He's obedient also. You know, we, we, have, we have similar situation in the Gospel of Luke. You see here, the angel talks to Joseph. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, um, the angel talks to Mary. Mm. Why here to Joseph? Yeah. It's for the purpose of verse 16, to say that Joseph had nothing to do with the, with, 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 the, with the birth of Jesus. And Joseph had a problem. Either Jesus is the divine Son of God, either Mary's telling him the truth, or it's all a lie. And that's the same issue that the readers had. Is Jesus the Son of God. Yep. Is, he, is He the Savior? Is He unique in human experience? <laughs> Joseph had to make that decision. So did the readers, so do we today. Actually, I would, I would really like to address the readers, uh, the, the, the viewers. You know, today there are many, many books appearing on the, on the, on the market 
with the ideas that Jesus was um, just a good rabbi. Another great person in history who did many good things, moral teachers, etc. But that's not what the Bible says. Mm. Jesus was not another man, a great person who appeared in history. Actually, he was God with us. Number one, with his coming, we have the fulfillment of God's promise given in the Old Testament that one day God himself will step into the human situation in order to provide salvation for human beings. Mm -hmm. But he came to his own people because they were waiting for that promised deliverer. Unfortunately, when we go to chapter two, what can we learn about his own people in chapter two there? It's so amazing for us to realize that their decisions are our decisions. Their willingness to accept Christ or reject Christ parallels our human experience today. We move into chapter two then. See, we, have, we are always confronted with that question. What are who, you going to do with Jesus? Who is Jesus Christ? We'll come to chapter 16. Jesus said, what do you say who I am? If Jesus was just a great moral teacher, a great person, a good, good rabbi, then what use of that? Mm. Actually, we have to understand he is the one, his name is Yeshua, because he came to save his people from their sins. All right, now in chapter two, Ooh. the scene changes. It changes from Mary and Joseph to other individuals, some from the east and some from Jerusalem and a pagan king. Let's explore that a little bit. Yeah, actually, how does chapter two begin? Let's go read verses. Um, the first three verses. Okay, uh, Matthew chapter two, verse yeah. one. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Okay, so when we read in the original language, we have uh, English translations, they call them wise men. Of course, they were wise men. Mm -hmm. And I will explain just in a few, few, few moments later. But in Greek text, they says they were magi. Actually, they were astrologers. Were they wise men? They were, because the reference goes to the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. You know, they came from the east, which was Babylonia. At the time of Daniel, they're astrologers. They were wise men. They're clearly called in the book of Daniel, referred to as wise men. They were people who were studying astrology. But evidently, th there is great news. Mm -hmm. What Daniel preached there and other Jews there in Babylon, evidently the seed was sown yes. there. And, you know, in the book Desire of Ages, which is one of my favorite inspired commentaries along with scripture yes. here, um, there's a reference to the fact that certain truths had been neglected by God's people. Mm -hmm. And God revealed them to the other nations. There were pagan philosophers, pagan writers, pagan thinkers who were seeking for the Messiah who would come. So there is truth hidden among these other nations. And apparently these are some men They've seen a star. They've seen something that's got their attention. They've gone to digging and studying the scriptures which had been revealed to them. And so they're, they're seeking to know more. Today, there are many, many who are seeking to know more about who Jesus is. And, and that's what the book of Matthew is telling us all about. We're going to be right back as we explore a little bit more about the wise men. We'll be with you in just a moment right after our break. Hi, I'm Dr. Hans Steele. Did you know that it is not natural for blood pressure levels to go up as we get older? But that's not the American way. By the time we're 50 years of age, our chance of high blood pressure are 60%, and by the time we're 70 years of age, it's more than 80%. And with that, we have to be concerned about vascular problems that can affect our hearts and minds, our eyes and ears. A major contributor to this hypertension epidemic is our Western diet which contains 10 to 15 times more salt than the body really needs. As a result, some people have banned their salt shakers totally unaware that 80% of our salt is found in processed and fast foods. My health tip for today is this. Yes, ban the salt shaker, but also become more aware of the salt content in processed and fast foods. Become a label reader, make better choices for better health and for lower blood pressure. We're exploring the birth of Jesus in the record of the book of Matthew. 
We've noticed Mary's response and Joseph's response of faith and obedience. Now we are entering into chapter two and we're seeing these, these Arab philosophers from the East who are coming. Uh, they come to Jerusalem, Ronco. Uh, why do they go there and what are they looking for? What's their question? They're seeking after God. You know, uh, usually when Bible readers, they read this event, they think that we have here a story that is not fit reality. They said, you know, Judea was a small country and the birth of one child that later became the leader, you know, great rabbi, does not fit the reality. I just want to read something to the readers is, you know, Jesus died somewhere in the year 33, up to mm -hmm. that time, you know, mm -hmm. so, uh, 31, okay. 31, you know, yeah. I would like something we have from two Roman historians. One was Tacitus, who lived from AD 60 to 120. Another one was Vetonius from 75 to 160, to telling us something very significant. They are Roman historians, have nothing to do with Jew Jew Jewish race. They said, there was a firm persuasion that at this very time, the East was to grow powerful and the rulers coming from Judea were to acquire universal empire. Suetonius, there had spread over all the Orient and all the established belief that it was fate at that time for men coming from Judea to rule the world. Scripture elsewhere says in the fullness of time. The it's the right time, there's an expectation. Believe me, uh, the, uh, knowledge of the coming of the Messiah was not just confined to Judea. The Romans were very much familiar throughout the Roman Empire. They were very much familiar about what the Jewish people were expecting to come to come there and to happen in, in, in Judea. There's an expectancy, there's a hope. Yeah. So these Magi, uh, they studied stars, but they studied also the Hebrew um, scriptures. May, may I just pause there for a moment because Usually we're so familiar with the Christian's Christmas story because of the pageants we see. And the shepherds and the wise men come at about the same time. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a difference in time here. Actually, we must say that uh, between verse 25 of chapter one and what happens in chapter two, uh, probably weeks, it could be even month that, that, that they pass. How do you know that? Probably the viewers would like to know that. Uh, Number one is, we read, when the Magi, they, they came there to Bethlehem, where did they find Joseph and Mary? Not in a stable. They found in a house, mm -hmm. but in Gospel of Luke, jo Jesus was not born in a house, he was born in the stable. So evidently by that time, Joseph and Mary moved to the house where they lived. And they came because they had seen the star. Yeah. It would take some time to come, to travel. Second thing is, in the conclusion of chapter two, when Herod, found out from Magi about the birth of the, of the, of the, of the, of the new king. Mm -hmm. He decided to kill all children up to two years of age. Why up to two years of age? If he knew that the child was born just a few days before or, or maybe a week he before. He could have said everyone a week or two. Or maybe that night that, that, that the boy was born. Why would he kill all those children up to two years of age? But second thing is in the Gospel of Luke, when Joseph and Mary, um, came there to Jerusalem to, with, with, with Jesus. They were so poor, they could not offer a lamb there as a sacrifice. They, you know, as a poor people, they bought, they bought two, two birds there. If really the Magi, they came prior to that, <laughs> they would be very rich people yes. with, with those gifts. So evidently all the evidences that indicate to us that Magi came maybe weeks, Again, after, we see, we see God's mercy. Jesus has come. Uh, the shepherds have responded. Uh, you would think the nation would be responding. Do we see a nation that's so glad their hope is finally fulfilled? The people are, are curious and they're rushing to learn more. So can you imagine the Messiah was born. Yeah. His people were waiting for his coming. He came to save them from their sins and nobody was waiting for him. Who were those in the Gospel of Matthew that were waiting for him? Actually, the Gentiles. Those Not only that they waited, that they were there in Jerusalem, they had to travel several weeks from Mesopotamia to come there to welcome the, new, the, the newborn king. When these seekers come, they come to Jerusalem, who do they see and what did they find out? Yeah, they saw the scribes, they saw the people, but they saw such a great indifference. 
I want us to go Nobody back to what you said last time, the people with the genealogy. Yeah. They go to those people with the genealogy. Yes. He came to save them. Now, save them. did the priests and rabbis have the facts? Did they have the, the truth? Did they have the knowledge? Yes. Actually, when um, the question was, where, would, where will the Messiah be born? Mm -hmm. They said in Bethlehem. They knew it. Actually, we have all the evidences that the Jewish people, based on Daniel chapter 9, they knew approximate the time when the Messiah would be born. They knew everything, but they were not waiting for Him. There's a warning for us, isn't oh, there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm so many times afraid. When we study the Bible, we know what the future will bring. And I'm afraid that that future can happen, mm -hmm. but it will not fit my expectations. How it's important to study the Bible as it is, not study and bring our ideas and our concept in study. So we can the know the signs and we can know the prophecies, but still miss the Savior. Yes. What a tragic, what a tra tragic experience. Now, of course, Herod gets involved in the process. What's his concern? He's the, he's the king. What does he care about a baby being born? You, you know, the readers who lived there in, in, the, in, the, in the first century, when they read, read all these accounts of Jesus' birth, they couldn't escape something because um, Josephus, who was Jewish historian, but he became later a Roman, actually he described that before Moses was born, that the Magi, they said to, 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 to Pharaoh, you know that a leader will come and he will take your throne, he'll be a threat to you. And according to the Jewish tradition is, Pharaoh wanted to kill Moses because he was a threat to his, to mm -hmm. his throne. The same situation is here. here. Is here. Herod was much more concerned about his throne. Probably few words should be said about, about Herod. <laughs> about Herod, we know that he killed his wife, his beloved wife, that he was obsessed with her beauty and so he killed her. He killed his two favorite sons. For Herod to kill several innocent children there in Bethlehem was nothing uh, strange, simply to preserve his rule, his rule on, on the throne. Actually, the history is telling us before Herod died, you know, that he gathered he assembled all the Jewish leaders. He put them in Jericho there on the stadium. And he said, the moment you hear that I died, I want to kill everybody there so they will be crying in the country. Otherwise, people will not cry when, when I die. See, it fits his character, what he, what, what he was doing there with reference to Jesus. I understand there's even a saying that said it's safer to be his dog than his family member yes. because if you're a rival, he'll eliminate you. So we have here in chapter two, Who's the true king of Israel? Isn't that the question? Yes. Who's the king? Yes, yes. Is it Herod or does God have no, someone else? No, actually Herod is here as a usurper of God's authority. He's the <laughs> one that Satan is using to prevent God's plan to accomplish, to accomplish God's, God's purposes, purposes on, on, on earth. Now Herod's very crafty about what he does. Yeah. He, he doesn't reveal his motivation. He says to the wise men, oh, I want to worship him too. But you know, there is something so beautiful here that I, I cannot but, but to mention it. So many times when we, the situation in the world, we wonder if God is still in control. Mm. When we see here what's going on, the, the Messiah is born and now there is a threat to his life. He even had to flee there, there to, to, to Egypt. Where is God? But believe me, God is still in charge. God is still in control. According to Matthew, even if Jesus had to flee there to Egypt, it was for the prophecy to be fulfilled. Could we spend a moment, you mentioned earlier about, about the gifts that these wise men bring. And we say three kings, but we don't know the number. Mm -hmm. that's, that's part of our stories that have developed, but they do bring three gifts. Yeah. What are they? What could they have been used for? How are they helpful? Actually, they were, expensive, they were very expensive gifts, and people are trying to make different theories of gold, frankness, and mirth, etc. I really don't want to go with that. Uh, sometimes it can, be, it can be very, very speculative, but really those three gifts can refer to the threefold aspect of Jesus' ministry and office, is the king, is the priest, 
and is, is the judge. You know. And it shows how God provides because those gifts yes. become the means for them to escape right. to Egypt. Can you imagine, not only the Messiah uh, was not waited for in Jerusalem by his own people, but he had to go and to flee and to find the protection in the Gentile territory, which was actually yeah. Egypt there where Jesus said, but God made a provision with the gifts of those, of those uh, magi so that Joseph and Mary could for a certain period of time mm -hmm. live there, there in Egypt in order, in order to survive. How God always makes provision. I suspect that we'll bring this out in future lessons about how Jesus repeats some of the history of Israel uh, and, and the correlation between those two. Actually, I would like to take one minute to address it because we have here uh, the significance of the Old Testament quotations mm -hmm. in Matthew 2. Just quickly, Matthew 2, 15. What, what, what do we have at 2, 15? Yes. And there was... Uh, Out of Egypt, I called my son. Yes. Then we have in 2, 6, we have you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, who are the least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my, my, my people Israel. And then in verse 2, 18, a voice from Jeremiah prophecy, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. By the way, we know that all these are three quotations from the Old Testament, and they refer to three greatest events in Israel uh, history. Matthew 2, 15, it's quotation from Hosea 11, 1. It refers to Exodus. Mm -hmm. Then we have Matthew 2, 6, from Micah 5, 2. It refers to the kingdom of David. You know Bethlehem, David was born. And then we have Matthew 2, 18, is quotation from Jeremiah 31, 15. It refer reference to the exile. So what is the point that we have here? You know, Jesus came to save his people from their sins. How? Because he identifies himself with them. Mm. We saw that genealogy, the history of God's people in the past was the history of a constant failure. Mm. But Jesus, in order to save them, he steps into their situation where they failed, he won the victory, and that's the way how he came to save his people from their, from their sins. As we conclude, what should we hold on to from this story of the birth of Jesus? What does it say to you and to me as readers today? So today, when we read the Gospel of Matthew, we can learn something else. We saw that the Gospel of Matthew began with a rejection of Jesus by his own people that actually he came to, sa to save. What is that hope for me as I read the Gospel of, of, of Matthew? So many times I feel in my life I have constant rejection of Jesus, but he still loves me. He loves his own people in the past, and he's ready to save me from my own sin. What a Savior.